Hey folks, just a heads up for upcoming live events as part of the Spooky Spectacular. We'll be doing a live stream and live recording event at Arcana in Durham, North Carolina on September 29th. Charlie will be at the Abbeville Upstate Spirit Conference in Abbeville, South Carolina. I'll be at Splatterflix in Durham at the Carolina Theater. And beyond Spooky Season, we'll both be at Retcon in Cary in February of 2023. There are links to all of those and more information in the show notes to this episode. Thanks a lot. You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Hey y'all, Michael here. Charlie and I both wanted to take a moment before this episode to offer a warning and then some commentary. First, this episode touches on both folklore and real history, some of it very recent, about people doing terrible things to other people, including assault and violence and murder. Given the sorts of episodes we've sometimes published with no such warning, we hope you realize this one goes way beyond our usual threshold for what we want to discuss. If you listen to this show with your kids, we suggest you listen to this episode yourself first to see if you're comfortable sharing it with them. Second, we want to emphasize the place we discuss in this episode is somewhere people should not go, out of respect for the people who have suffered and died there. This episode is about a place we've had a lot of requests to discuss. Those requests come from people who've heard the sort of spooky stories we all think are fun, ghostly voices and objects that move on their own, stuff like that. But our reason for suggesting folks steer clear of it has nothing to do with those. Instead, it's because this place was new to both of us, and our research turned up some really horrific legends about types of abuse that were very real in many places in our region's history, and those stories are not fun, nor are they funny, nor do we want to treat them lightly or take them as entertainment. Just as importantly, the real history of this place turned out to involve a great deal of violence and death with real victims who were real people, and we believe those victims deserve peace and respect. Neither the sorts of legends we turned up nor the real history we discovered are things we really enjoy discussing, and we probably would not have bothered to record this episode or to publish it, except we've had so many requests to talk about this place that we want to take this as an opportunity to encourage people to stay away from it. There are countless other places in the Carolinas where we can go in search of history and adventure and the sort of thrill one can only find by the light of the moon. Out of respect for the real victims of the real crimes that happened here, we suggest you cross this place off your list and go with one of those instead. Hello and welcome to Arcane Carolinas. I'm your co-host, Charlie Mushaw, and I've definitely not been bothering Michael with stories from 20 years ago. <laughs> I have. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> And I am your other co-host, award-winning novelist, Michael G. Williams, and I enjoy those stories, so I'm not going to complain. 20 might be an exaggeration. It's probably more like 12, 15. Anyway, point is, today's stories on Arcane Carolinas are going to go back way further than that, but then also come right up to present day, and it's few and far between the times that I have said what I'm about to say. Today's episode is going to mention some truly awful things that actually happened to real people in contemporary times. I guess you'd call this a trigger warning. Mm -hmm. I did not particularly enjoy the research on this one, to be okay. honest with you. Is this uh, something that people should maybe consider not listening to with their kids? Yes. Okay. Yes. The legends are fun, right? Like ghost stories are fun and legends are fun. And that is a way that we digest and process tragedy a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But the real tragedies 
that have occurred in the location that we're going to be talking about are very much real and do have true victims, true innocent victims. Mm -hmm. And I'm not big on celebrating or glorifying crimes where there's innocent victims. You want to tell me a crime story about somebody that ripped off a casino for like briefcases full of money? That's a story that I will laugh about. (laughs) But when you start talking about women and children being victimized in ways that are uncomfortable to discuss, I don't like that kind of true crime. To lift the curtain briefly, when we've talked about some examples of that kind of thing in the past, then I've referred to it as the grief industrial complex. And I can name shows of whom this is not true. For instance, I think True Crime Buzz, this is not true of. They're a great example of, of people who avoid doing this. But sometimes the true crime genre is actively seeking to exploit the suffering of others in a way that almost comes off as, isn't it great that this happened so that we can talk about it? And that's not ever the case. I don't ever want a bad thing to happen to a person so that I can do a show about it. Yeah. So we're not going to get giddy or celebratory or glamorous about some of the murders that will be mentioned in this episode. But when we get past the legends and into the source of those legends, there will be some disturbing content. I'm not going to get gross about it. I don't like the Saw movies. That is not my kind of horror. (laughs) Um, But uh, just there's your trigger warning. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we've talked in the past, especially around the Daniel Keith episode and other episodes, the ways that, like you said, folklore and legends and things like that are sort of a digestive mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, They're kind of the digestive organism of culture in a lot of ways, the digestive organ of culture <laughs> the small intestine <laughs> yeah i mean kind of you know it's like they're they're a mechanism we have for dealing with really horrible things and sometimes we deal with really horrible things by sort of wrapping them up in a story that lets us put a barrier of insulation between the real tragedy and our engagement with it yep so today's story comes from a town called rural hall are you familiar with rural hall no It's also known as the Garden Spot of the World. It's the operational center for the Yadkin Valley Railroad. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's in the same county as Mm -hmm. Winston-Salem. And we we did cover that in the Little Red Man of Old Salem episode. So I am going to skip, what is that, Forsyth County? Yes. I'm going to skip the Forsyth County history, but specifically in Rural Hall, uh, we're going to be talking about the many legends of Payne Road. Okay. And Payne Road has a lot of different legends and they're pretty divisive. There's a lot of people on the internet that will swear they know the real story, (laughs) (laughs) which is great. I love when an argument says, I know for a fact, comma. Yeah. Uh, Like I was there, which I wasn't, but you know, right. There is a Facebook, like, I don't want to say fan page, but for lack of a better word, fan page (laughs) about (laughs) Payne Road Uh, with thousands of people on it. There's been YouTube documentaries, multi-part series on the legends of Payne Road. The Forsyth County Library blog has an amazing piece about uh, the Legends of Pain Road that is really well researched and um, that I definitely, you know, used as a source for, for this episode. But the bottom line is that everyone agrees that historically, this has been a place with really bad vibes and a lot of truly awful things have transpired on pain slash Edwards Road. Okay. Can I ask for a moment if you would take a second to clarify the spelling of pain? Pain. P is in pain. A <laughs> is in pain. Y is in pain. Okay. N is in pain. E is in pain. All right. So it's not literally <laughs> P-A-I-N road. It's Yes. Yeah. It's, okay. like the, it's like the surname. Right. Okay. So, uh, and I'll refer to it as Payne or Edwards Road kind of interchangeably because there still is a Payne Road and it turns on to Edwards Road. Neither are that long of a road. And the general story goes that the legends occur on the section that is now called Edwards Road. Some people say that it was changed because of all the bad things that happened there. And for stigma, I did find a comment on an internet forum from somebody that worked for the North Carolina Department of Transportation that said, that is not true. There were just too many pain roads. (laughs) Very believable. And for 911 purposes back in the Mm -hmm. 90s, they took the opportunity when it was being redone. It was that section of of what is now Edwards Road was had previously been gravel Mm -hmm. and had a bridge on it. So they took the bridge out, replaced it with culvers and paved it. 
And they took that opportunity when it was closed for all this rehabilitation to be like, you know what? It intersects with pain road up there, but like, that's a different thing. And then this is, you know, like the pain road extension, whatever, like we're just going to call it Edwards road. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, I did once live in a house that was functionally, (laughs) it was at the court, like it's a different name, but it had a very distinctive name. So I'm going to change his name, but I effectively lived at the corner of Jones and Jones. Literally one of them was Jones street and one of them was Jones trail. So I lived in a house once where the second half of the name was Barry, you know, as in the fruit. <laughs> sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But there was another street in town, like Barry, like you would think of like Woodbury or you know what I mean? Oh, right. Like, yeah. Like, like something like, like B-R-U-I. We got mail for this contractor. He was a plumber and he lived on the street with the alternate spelling at the same <laughs> address. And we would get like little like a pvc end cap that he had obviously ordered for a job or (laughs) like a piece of pipe (laughs) we could always get this poor guy's mail it was just like oh i'm glad his plumbing business is doing well enough that (laughs) he's still ordering parts via the mail yeah so anyway pain road edwards road just wanted to explain uh some of the logic behind that so the bridge is gone from some of the legends but then there's people on the internet that say Oh, that wasn't the bridge of the legends. There's another bridge and I know where it is. And don't you love armchair experts on the internet? (laughs) Right. Give us a Google Maps address that we can go look at if you've got something like that. It's my secret bridge. It's basically like a semicircle, right? It's like it's like half of a circle where Edwards Road goes up and then turns into Payne Road. Mm hmm. And it sits just north of downtown Royal Hall, west of Germantown, on the Payne Branch stream off of Town Fork Creek. And that will become relevant later. Sure. So, the legend. There are stories that while you're driving down Payne Road, or now Edwards Road, you might see a ghost car behind you. Or hear the voices of deceased people. People have reported, like if they park, they'll hear people like crying out. You might see either a person-shaped mist moving down the side of the road at a time where there's no fog. Or you might see a full-on apparition. Oh, these voices that people hear of the deceased, are they deceased people known to them or are they? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, Yeah, it's not like your great uncle Bob reaching out to you. (laughs) In some ways that makes it less frightening and in some ways that makes it more frightening so. right car experiencing engine failure oh if you park your car regardless of whether there's an incline or not it will move if you leave it in neutral and you will wind up with tiny handprints on the back of your car oh <sighs> yeah real all american haunted road legends basically all the haunted road legends that you've ever heard growing up are they all have a place on this road did did you ever have like a scary road or haunted road (laughs) spot yeah (laughs) yeah i'm gonna leave it there (laughs) maybe one day i'll tell those stories so me too like there was like oh you go over these hills and when you go over the last one at midnight you'll see that the ghost car will appear further back and it'll catch up to you or like you might see a woman walking down the side of the road or the crybaby bridge or you know gravity hill like all these sorts of things and they're all all this phenomena multiple people report these various phenomena as occurring on this road And you'll find people on the internet that swear that it happened to them. Some people will be like, I don't know about the Gravity Hill stuff, but I do know that our engine failed. And when we got back to the house, you know, we noticed that there were little handprints on the back of the car and like stuff like that. Or like, I don't know anything about that, but I do know that I heard something while I was parked where the bridge used to be like that kind of thing. Mm, We're going to come back to that. But anyway, go ahead. So people are adamant that these phenomena all occur within this very concentrated place, very narrow slice of land. And it doesn't sound like this is a terribly long stretch of road. It's not. It's not. We'll put a map up uh, on the Facebook page or something. Uh, it's, It's not. It's very short. These are a lot of different legends. So there are multiple stories here for Payne Road. I'm going to do them chronologically. So in the 1800s, there was a plantation owner, and these are the legends, named Robert Payne, who was a particularly nasty man towards the enslaved people that worked on his land. I've made this reference before. Think Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Django. Mm -hmm. The cartoon character of a evil slave owner. Right. Exceptionally cruel. Yes. So the story goes that he had four daughters 
and one of them became pregnant after getting involved with one of the enslaved folks. Mm -hmm. So in a rage, Robert has the would be father killed. Right. And this is not good. Yeah. But then it gets worse because another one of his daughters got pregnant by a different enslaved person. And he completely loses it. One account that I read was in the Carolina Haints book. I couldn't find the source online, but in the Carolina Haints book, they reported in their research finding that he renounced God and pledged himself to the devil. (laughs) And this next part is agreed upon by all accounts in that he then went on a murderous rampage, killed all of the enslaved people on the property and his family, Mm. killed them all. And burned the plantation to the ground and then killed himself. Wow. That is pretty horrific. So supposedly that area where the plantation was is where you hear voices call out from the dark and you might see a person shaped mist floating down the road. (sighs) When we talked about the high house backstory, Mm -hmm. I said, you know, if you're the sort of person who believes that a place can become haunted because of the cruelty and the evil done there, then this place is going to be pretty haunted. It's kind of like, and, and also like the squeaky pines, a lot of parallels to the squeaky pines story mm-hmm. in this one as well. It's, it's interesting also that mm-hmm. it includes that note about him renouncing God and pledging himself to the devil in a lot of folklore about crimes like this, especially particularly awful crimes where someone's cruelty is just unfathomable, then that becomes a way to supernaturalize that person's crime. That's one of the layers of insulation that folklore wants to put between the crime and the people engaging with it after. We, You and I have discussed this where it's like, oh, well, you know, my stepdad did this awful stuff and, but it wasn't really him. It was the possession, right? You know, that kind of thing. And it's a way to rationalize and be like, well, he wasn't that bad of a guy. He just, it, it wasn't really him. Mm-hmm. Lots of us have had people in our lives of whom we had to be afraid. And that is a way to like begin to try to process that sort of awful reality. Yeah. So that's the first legend. And if you fast forward to the 1930s, there's actually two legends from that decade. The first is that a young man was driving too fast as they are want to do. I'm looking at myself as I say that. <laughs> and remember, this was a gravel road up until the 90s. So it's very easy to imagine losing control of your car on a gravel road. Oh, yeah. And while trying to straighten it out and approaching the bridge that was there, he was unable to write it and crashed. Now, fortunately, there were people that heard the commotion because if uh, if you've ever been near a car wreck in the country, you can hear it <laughs> when cars oh, yeah. are moving at speed. I mean, you know, you know the story about where I used to live. I had a guy crash in the ditch in front of my house and like, yeah, you just swore a cannon went off. Mm-hmm. So people came to save him or see what was up, but he was trapped in the car and burnt alive while they watched. Oh, gosh. And that is where the origin of the the painter Edwards Road late night, you might see headlights in your rear view of a car that is following you and it will vanish as soon as you get to where the bridge was. Right. So that's the ghost car. Yeah. Now, the next one from the 30s says that there was a man named Edward Payne and he lived on Payne Road, now Edwards Road, and he apparently lost his mind and tied his wife to a chair in the living room of their house and killed all of their children in front of her. Oh, my God. The last child was an infant and the mother broke loose, grabbed the kid and ran out of the house, made it to the bridge before he caught up with her cut her head off and then oh. and then disposed of the infant down a well. Oh. He then apparently came out of his psychosis, realized what he had done and hung himself from the bridge. Mm-hmm. And it's said that you can hear a baby crying if you park where the bridge was. Wow. This neck of the woods has a lot going on. Yeah. So all in all, I hate these stories. They really make me exceptionally sad. And yeah. uh, I was like, man, this, you know, I like a good legend. I like a good ghost story. I do. But like the nature of these, I was like, well, I, I need to get to the bottom of this. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was hoping that I'd be able to rule a bunch of stuff out, but it did not go particularly well. Ah, OK. So we'll talk about what's real and what's not. Right. And I, I got some of this from the Forsyth County Library, confirmed with GIS records and Ancestry.com. There's a book titled The Heritage of Stokes County, Stoke County, which is what Forsyth County was formed out of. Mm-hmm. 
And on this very detailed library blog, they, they explore and explain that land adjacent to the site where what was known as the Payne House, it once stood, it burned down. It was like, you know, the spooky old house on the road. Mm-hmm. That land is held in trust by descendants of one Robert Payne. So going back to the, the plantation owner. Oh, wow. So Robert Payne existed and he lived near the Sandy Ridge area of Stokes County, Mm -hmm. but he was a extremely affluent landholder and had land all over the county, including the area that is now Edwards slash Payne Road. Right. Okay. And according to the Heritage of Stokes County and Ancestry.com, he owned between 25 and 35 enslaved people. And that Mm -hmm. is based on the schedules from the federal census from 1850 to 1860. So he existed. If you look closer, this is where like it gets a little bit better here. He had a big family. He had at least 10 children. Jeez. Six of these were girls. It also shows that Robert Payne left a will in 1873. And in that will, enslaved people were included as as being willed to different members of the family. Okay. So my guess is, correct me if I'm wrong, he died in 1873 mm-hmm. and his will had just happened to have been written before emancipation. Yeah. Okay. He obviously did not kill all the enslaved people. He right. obviously, obviously had more than four daughters. There was no wholesale murder of the family or slaves. Okay. That's a good thing to know. So he existed. Robert Payne absolutely existed, owned land there, had enslaved people working his land. All, that part is true. Okay. Everything else is verifiably not true. Okay. So that made me feel pretty good. Ooh, that is a relief. Yeah. Okay. Right. I was like, all right. All right. Yeah. And with regards to the car crash, big shocker, I could not find records of a car crash on a gravel road from the 1930s. <laughs> okay. I will say this, though. Having grown up on a gravel road, mm-hmm. not only have I been in a car that accidentally lost control on the gravel road while going too fast around a curve, but there was a point in time, and I'm not proud of this, in which a pastime that was known among my friends, I will not say that I did this, was fishtailing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, where you get on the gravel road and you you rock the wheel back and forth and you see yeah, it's if you fun. Can make it spin a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man, to be sixteen and real dumb again. I like doing that in the snow in a giant empty parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably safer. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, these days, I'm too old for stuff like that. But I did think it was worth noting that we have the confirmed case that we did the episode on the spontaneous human combustion of somebody catching fire and people running to the car to try to help them and the person just burning up in the car. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought of when you said that. So it's interesting, right? Like I was like, okay, well, I can't find a record of a car crash on the gravel road in the 1930s. But I do know that, you know, like mid-century, I think it was post-war, mid-century that somebody did burn up in a car in front of an audience and and we did a whole episode on it yeah so i was like huh interesting so then we get to the story that really bothers me you know with the edward Payne, and there is no record of edward Payne or Payne edwards or edwards Payne or no matter how you spell it right you cannot find that person or anybody that could be that person living in that area mm-hmm Unfortunately, there is a story that we have been asked to cover repeatedly that occurred right up the little creek, like as the crow flies, extremely close. Uh, And that is the Lawson family murders in the town of Germanton. Oh, okay. You've mentioned them before. I don't really know anything about them. So it's very easy to see how this story got mixed up via oral tradition and people telling tales Mm -hmm. of the very true story of the Lawson family murders that occurred right off of Brooks Cove Road in Germantown on Christmas Day, 1929. So the time is the right time. And you say, oh, the 30s, it's 1929. Yeah. It's right up the road. And it is a horrible story. Uh, It involves a guy named Charlie Lawson. He murdered his wife and six of his children. Oh, God. His oldest son was away from home at the time. And then a few hours after the murder, he killed himself. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of speculation as to the motivation that is sensational and gross. One bit of speculation that was ruled out was that he had suffered a traumatic brain injury and the old Phineas Gage psych 101 thing, right? 
they did a full autopsy on him and his brain revealed no abnormalities. So the, mm-hmm. the motivation is speculated, but unknown. Right. There is a wild theory that I like as far as being able to like something from this goes that the blood from those murders entered the stream and flowed down to Payne Road, thus cursing the entire area. Hmm. We're going to come back to that one, too. OK. Yeah. So that would explain the strange activity around the bridge, right? Yeah. To further showing how gross people can be, shortly after the murders, his brother, Marion Lawson, opened the home on Brook Cove Road as a tourist attraction. Oh, my God. There was a cake that had been baked on Christmas Day that was preserved and put on display for part of the tour. And visitors would pick at it to take souvenirs. Oh, my God. And it was placed under glass. And um, I just think it's a really sad story that has been exploited. And there's documentaries on it. There's a book about it. People seem pretty enamored with it. All in all, I think it's a lot of innocent people that suffered pretty greatly. And I I don't love that story, especially the fact that it's true. Yeah. Um, So is that the end of tragedies (laughs) on Payne Road? I, you know, I don't know. Moments of tremendous tragedy like this and suffering like this are so rare in the average life that mm-hmm. it's hard for me to even begin to approach the topic from the perspective of my own experiences and have much of a meaningful opinion on it other than, gosh, I hope I never find myself in that circumstance. Yeah. And the hits keep coming. Great. It is not the end of tragedy on pain road. Okay. Multiple accounts state that the clan would hold meetings and cross burnings in the area as Ooh. recently as the 1980s. Ooh. Um Okay. So apparently that activity has, you know, dried up and, and, and ceased to be. But as recently as the 80s, that was still going on there. My hope is that everyone who is engaged in that is dead and that they died horribly. <laughs> there are more, unfortunately, there are more innocent victims of tragedy on Payne Road. We're like well into modern times now, so I don't want to dwell. But in December of 1992, there was an absolutely horrific crime committed against a woman by two individuals that culminated with her death they were convicted of absolute atrocities gosh as recently as 2021 a man was arrested for the murder of a minor who was found dead on Payne road near where it intersects with edwards road so these are all very real people that have had a lot of tragedy on the same very very small strip of land i don't know man for me this one was kind of a sobering one for me like i didn't i didn't particularly enjoy the pain road exploration i think ghost stories are fun i think legends are fun i like talking about the boogeyman and sasquatch and interdimensional theories and ufos but if there was ever a place that i would just say like just stay away nothing good can come of it it would be edwards and pain road Yeah, I'm going to say this. It's not even the first time I've said this in the last few months. We have a couple of listeners who like to go to the places that we've talked about and tell us about having gone there. And I think that's awesome. I really hope that they stay away from Payne Road. I would really prefer that they not go there. My advice would be don't go there. We've talked about this a little bit. Like sometimes places just have a vibe, for lack of a better word, vibe, like energy vibe, whatever you Mm -hmm. want to call it. I have been places... Where like you you just don't feel comfortable in your own skin, right? And you're like something's up, and it's uh, I'm good. And this is one of those places for me. I, without even having been there, that I can tell you, knowing what I know now about the history there, I'm like I'm good. I don't I don't need that location in my life. Yeah. Are you ready for me to get real weird about it? Yes, please do. Okay. So I don't know why I hesitate to say this because it seems so obvious to me. But anyway, I do believe in a supernatural. I don't know, element to our existence or a layer to reality. I don't know oh, exactly absolutely. how to phrase it. Yes, no, absolutely. And, yeah. Can, and, can we talk about that for a second? Uh, sure, yeah. Just a really simple explanation. Consciousness. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Right? That If we can't define it, then by its nature, that is supernatural. Yeah, and the question of does consciousness arise from matter or is it some interaction between something supernatural and something material? Right. You know, that's one that's only occupied philosophers for probably 10,000 years. So I certainly don't have the answer other than that my personal lot is cast with the supernatural Mm -hmm. things. But suffice to say, I believe that very firmly that there are places that exist behind the curtain. And I don't know if that's because of the things that happen there that sort of drag them behind the curtain forever, or if it's because that place has always been behind the curtain and thus they have drawn to them 
bad things, mm. but I believe that there are places that exist behind the curtain and that sometimes there are places where good things happen. And a lot of times there are places where really, really awful things happen and keep happening. And every culture in the world that we know of believes in places of power in some form or another. And sure. I think that those are the places that are behind the curtain. And for whatever reason, this is one of those. And, uh, and it's like, it, it also, I think that over time, as more tragedies happen in a place like that, then those tragedies become a sort of magnet for more tragedies. Somebody who has grown up hearing stories of the awful things done there, when whatever breaks inside them breaks so that they decide to do something awful also, they may be drawn to that place as the place where they will do it. You know, yeah. And at the same time, like I said, I think the folklore and supernaturalizing an event like this is a way to try to like wrap the event up so that we can safely engage it. You know, they're the oven mitts of dealing with horrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to like rationalize away the terrible things that have happened to anybody in any era, especially people who like suffered and died in like the modern era. Somebody, you know, a child who suffers and is killed in in 2021, I don't want to disrespect the memory of that child or the grief of the parents that that child had or the grief of the people who have known anyone who suffered in this place. Mm -hmm. It's um, that is way more articulate and well put than I don't know, man, sometimes places have a bad vibe. But like the fact that you could say some places have a bad vibe and know that everybody will know what you mean. Yeah. That speaks to what I think is the reality of that. And we don't have a way to explain it. And that's why it's behind the curtain, but it's real. And we mm -hmm. know it's back there. Yeah. And if somebody's like, I don't believe in the supernatural. I'm like, how does consciousness work? Yeah. Like, let's just leave it at that. If, if you can't answer that and you believe that you are a unique consciousness, then guess what? I hate to break it to you. You believe in the supernatural. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> You might not think you do, but you do <laughs> call it the soul, call it consciousness, whatever you want to call it. If you believe that we are not all NPCs walking around, <laughs> you know, in a video game and that we are, in fact, our own things, then you believe in the supernatural to some degree. Yeah. And to be clear, I don't think that the supernatural is necessary to explain the human capacity for evil. I think a lot. No, of no, no. I think a lot of people who look to stories like he renounced God and swore himself to the devil, they're trying to explain away the human yeah. capacity for evil. Now, we don't need the supernatural for there to be the human capacity for evil. Human people make evil choices all the time. Sure. I, don't, I don't mean like little inconvenient choices, and I don't even mean just like bad stuff they do to other people. I mean, evil choices, and yeah. that, that exists independent of the supernatural. Yep. So that's it. That's the legend. Th that is the many legends of pain road, the actual tragedies that I could find that have occurred there. We have been asked to cover pain road. We have been asked to cover the loss and family murders. Uh, we sort of rolled them into one and really looking forward to a, a nice palate cleanser <laughs> episode after this. And I'm going to go ahead and say that based on some of the content of this, then like the show notes for this will include links to a couple of things like a suicide prevention hotline and things like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Organizations that are actively engaged in trying to reduce incidents of domestic violence. Yeah. Things like that will definitely be linking to. And maybe once I've got links to those, I'll also record a little postscript to tack onto the end to say it out loud also. But that's it. Not going to end this one with a joke. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating, leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind the scenes info, pictures, videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut, check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our Patreon, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all that in one place, including the merch store. Buy a shirt. Clothe your body. Drape your body in our wares. <laughs> Be our living billboards. <laughs>